Thank you all for coming tonight. We know that it's freezing cold again and that it's been a long winter and that you all have uh, family and other obligations. So we really do appreciate uh, you joining us and um, listening to our first professional speaker that is coming to the district under the grant uh, that I uh, wrote for CEF last year called Future Focused Education. And the purpose of these talks and sessions uh, really is to uh, broaden our, our minds and, and have us thinking about what our children will need down the road uh, when they graduate and leave us after they're done with their educations here, whether it's this coming June when our seniors will be walking uh, to uh, receive their diplomas like we saw in the video, or it's our incoming kindergartners who are registering right now and will graduate uh, in the year 2027 or something like that. So let me just say a few words about our featured speaker tonight. His name is Glenn Heemstra. I first had a chance to listen to Glenn speak at, the, uh, at Rutgers University's Graduate School of Education. Uh, and he was thought provoking and had a, a, a rousing reception from the audience. Uh, Glenn is the founder and owner of Futurist.com. He is dedicated to disseminating information about the future to assist individuals, organizations, and industries in effective strategic planning. An inter internationally respected expert on future trends, long range planning, and creating the preferred future, Glenn has advised professional business and governmental organizations for two decades and has served as a technical advisor for futuristic television programs. Glenn has worked with many leading companies, government agencies, and organizations across a wide variety of domains. These include Microsoft, The Home Depot, Boeing, Adobe, Ernst & Young, Payne Weber, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Eddie Bauer, Procter & Gamble, and many, many more. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Heemstra share some of his insights with us tonight, and I am pleased to welcome him to the school district of the chat. Uh, let me see, who, let me find out a little bit more this here. Uh, how many of you have uh, children in uh, elementary or middle school? And how many in, have uh, kids in high school? Yeah, how, how many don't, don't have any kids in the school? Everybody cares about any other students here? Anybody currently in, in the school? One. One. Okay. That's good. Uh, well, and let me uh, let me answer the first questions. Uh, six foot seven. Yes, I did. I did play back in the day when, when all the players were skinny and everybody wore really short shorts. Basketball. And uh, and then the third question always is, uh, what is the future and how do you become one? I've had students ask me that question. And there is a growing cadre of people in the world who are so-called professional futurists. I know I know many from around the country. Uh, and there are some undergraduate and graduate school programs in the United States and typically one in the academic world called Futures Studies. You can go learn basically about how to analyze trends, uh, do kind of systematic forecast. They call it, they have a special language for it, but it's essentially trying to understand the implications of where the world is going. And then you add in a little bit of organizational theory or design work, a little bit of business administration, and some other fields of study to it, and when you come out with a degree on you know, how to think about the future and how to more effectively assist organizations plan for it. And if, if, that, if the future is your thing as a student, that, or your, for your kids' thing, I wouldn't discourage them from going into that field. It's actually quite a good field. There's an increasing number of uh, companies that have full-time futurists. I know the futurist at Ford. Uh, I know the futurist at Cisco. Hershey Chocolate, just up the road, uh, recently advertised for a features. They were hired. And, uh, they come in and they help the strategy partners think about where the world's going on a little bit more. I pray they use. You can find me here, uh, as is obvious, I have written a little bit. Our most recent book is called uh, Millennial City How a New Generation Can uh, Save the Future. And essentially, what this Canadian author named Dennis Walsh and I did in this book was to to make a simple observation, we both have kids who are in their 20s, and uh, they've all moved to the city, uh, like so many people are doing, and we know that the biggest uh, population trend in the whole world is what? 
it's people moving to metropolitan areas, moving to cities. The you know, rural across the 50% of people living in cities threshold is about 2007. So the U.S. is headed in that direction too. We might already be there. Uh, and we know that by 2030 or 2040, the UN Population Bureau, for example, predicts that 70% of the world's population will live in cities. So what does that mean? Well, that means that cities better work if we're going to have a good future for people to live in. There's all kinds of reasons why people want to live in cities, reasonable convenience, affordable jobs, uh, and so on, and we don't all have to work in cities. Uh, so we wrote a book, we said, well, so if the future depends on cities being successful, and young people are mostly moving to cities, then it's going to probably be up to young people to figure out how to make cities successful. So we try to tell some stories about who's doing what in uh, North America in particular in rural areas. So that's the kind of thing that I do. I'm from Seattle, and um, I work with all kinds of organizations, uh, as, as Mike mentioned in the introduction, and, and have done this for about 20 years since I left original career was, in, was as a college professor. And that means I get in front of lots of groups who basically want to ask the question, what should we get ready for? Or what is the future really going to be like? Or how can we plan more effectively for the future? We had a very nice conversation this afternoon at the administration uh, with uh, building with uh, a group of the kind of senior administration people in the district about sort of what does the future look like? And we were, we were speculating about if, uh, if a young kid is entering kindergarten this year, or next fall, really next fall in, in, in the district, that means they're graduating, in, if they stay here the whole time, in 2027. So what, what, what do they need to know in 2027? What's the world going to be like in 2027 that we should be getting our, our kids ready for? Uh, in a sense, we're asking the question that you see on the screen, what is your image of the future? I'm going to ask you that question in, in just a moment. Uh, and literally what I mean is, uh, when you think of the future, what kind, what comes to your mind? What kind of picture or word or phrase pops into your mind when you hear the future? Uh, what is it? Uh, why don't you turn to somebody sitting next to you or nearest to you, and if you're, if you're too isolated, just think for yourself for a second. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you just uh, like 40 seconds, so you got 20 seconds each if you're talking to a neighbor. What pops into, what pops into your head when you think of the future? Okay, time's up. What, uh, what, what, is, what, are, some, what are some images that, that come into your mind? Just uh, raise your hand and point to the person next to you and say, she had a really good one, she's got to tell you what it is. Okay, all right. There we go. The Jetsons. Okay, yeah. Uh, the Jetsons is an interesting cultural phenomenon. We'll come back to that in a second, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. So beyond the little earpiece or uh, headphones, but a micro, micro, microphone implanted in your cheek. I've read science fiction novels in which then the microphone is in your cheek. You know, so, and, and people actually then, can see the, what they do, they call it sub-vocalizing in these science fiction novels. Where you can talk with your mouth closed, just kind of in the back of your throat, just to kind of form the shape that, that, that picks it up until you communicate that way. It's cool. Uh, that seems, you know, relatively likely. It's certainly possible. What's another one? I can't see with the spotlight too well, so. Uh, who else had had a particular color? Yeah. Lots of technology. And uh, she's thinking more like social isolation. Yeah, like uh, uh, we, somebody this afternoon was, was talking about seeing a group of kids waiting for, the, waiting for transportation or something, and 75% of them are out doing this. You know, nobody's talking to each other. Well, is that really the future, and is it harmful if it is? That's a all a very, very interesting question, right? Uh, let's talk about the Jetsons for just a second. Uh, a few of us in the audience are, are old enough to remember the Jetsons as a television show. And uh, there's probably no cultural phenomenon which had a bigger impact on shaping our image of what the future was supposed to be like. Flying cars, right, and moving sidewalks, and household robots, and living in space, and all that kind of thing. Uh, the Jetsons was a cartoon show 
filmed in black and white for one television season in 1963. It was on for 26 episodes in 1962-63. Uh, and it changed our picture forever of what the people were supposed to be all about. Now, it did get resurrected uh, in the mid-1970s, and there were two more television seasons of it, and there was a movie, a uh, cartoon movie made of the Jetsons. And the Smithsonian Magazine did a feature on each of the original Jetsons episode last year on the 50th anniversary of that show. And kind of their, their impact on what we all thought people could go. I guess this is not a scene from the Jetsons, but the little scene there is essentially a Jetsons kind of scene. It's an interesting question. What is your image of the future? Why is it important? It's important because our answer, whether we think about it very deliberately or not, tends to exert an influence over the choices that we make today. If you want to change what you're doing today, change the future. Let me give you a quick example. This is a little story that Alvin Toffler used to to tell, I think at least I read it in one of his books called He Views the Premises. You know, the original, one of the original futurists, really, when you think about it, uh, Imagine a group of people living, uh, a tribe of people, uh, like an ancient tribe of people, living on the banks of a river. Imagine something maybe down in the Amazon or somewhere like that. And they live on the banks of this river, and they catch fish to eat, and they, they travel maybe a 50 mile radius by foot. Uh, at, the, at a maximum uh, to hunt, and so on. And this is the way that they've always lived for as long as anybody in the tribe can remember. And to be more efficient in fishing, they build little dugout canoes, and they go up and down the river, never more than 50 miles, but they go up and down the river a little ways, and they build catwalks out over the river to fish more effectively, and so on. This is not very far-fetched. It's how most people in the world live, not that many hundreds or thousands of years ago. Uh, and makes a lot of sense. And so when a child is born into this tribe, everybody in the tribe gets together in a room like this, and they say, so what do we need to teach this kid so they can live in our tribe, right? And they think, well, let's see, as far back as we can remember, we've always lived here on the river. And so we need to teach this child how to swim, how to fish, how to build fish hooks, how to build nets, how to build a dugout canoe, how to navigate up and down the river, uh, how to hunt for animals, etc., etc. All the skills and knowledge which are necessary for living in our tribe on the river. Isn't this precisely what we do with our schools, right? Now, unknown to our tribe, there is a second tribe which lives 100 miles up the river, outside the Pacific region. And this tribe has discovered a new technology, and the technology is uh, for building a dam. And they are busily engaged building a dam across the river. Which means that by the next dry season, the river is going to be reduced to a mere trickle and the fish are going to be gone. Our tribe faces a revolution, but it doesn't know it because it doesn't see it. And it doesn't see it mostly because it doesn't even think to look for it. If they did, they would think, you know, I wonder if there's something out beyond the 50 mile radius. I wonder if every now and then we ought to send a scouting party out, maybe a hundred miles, to see if there's anything going on. Well, if we did that, somebody from a scouting party might come back and say, you know, there's another tribe, and they're building this thing across the river, and it looks like it's going to block all the water. And then we would begin answering the question, what do we need to keep our kids a little bit different? This is what futurists do, and this is what uh, organizations can do if they decide to engage in looking at the future beyond the horizon, beyond where we typically look, and especially beyond what we've always known. And the question when you're answering the question, the, the question uh, what is your the future, what you're really looking for is, what is out there that way that is different from what we've always known? What is something that might surprise you? And you know that the world is full of dams which are being built right now. In fact, you know that dams are being built all the time because you, you go back to your office wherever you work, uh, whether it's here at the school district or whether it's a place for downtown or wherever it might be, and you walk into the office on Monday and you hear somebody say, oh, damn. And you know that they just discovered a dam that was built across the river over the weekend that they didn't expect, right? So where are these? What is your image of the future? Why is this important? Uh, ask that. Now, one of my favorite people in the world, I had a chance to meet him a couple of times, probably the most inspirational person I've ever met besides the person would have inspired me to be a futurist. This is the first guy I ever met who was sort of like this. He's a space guy. You, you might have heard his name, I'm not sure you have. It's Elon Musk. 
Elon Musk was a co-creator of PayPal, he sold that, and then he uh, created uh, Tesla, which uh, a certain governor just made very difficult to sell in the state of New Jersey, according to the newspapers that I read. Uh, recently, so I was going to have to go to New York again by Tesla. Uh, and, and he's into the space business. Uh, and when you uh, think, well, who is it that thinks in this such a big way about the future? He's always looking sort of beyond the horizon. And what could you get? What could ever come of doing that? Because it seems so impractical and your head would always be in the clouds. And, and why would you waste time doing that when there's actual work to be done? Well, this is a guy who every now and then thinks over the horizon and based on that thinking, it creates something new. This is uh, uh, Elon Musk. My name is Elon Musk. I help with PayPal and then Tesla. NASA turns to the private sector to resupply the International Space Station. I recently helped create SpaceX. The reason I got into space exploration was because it didn't seem to me that, that we've been making the progress that we should make, given the fact that we could get to the moon in 1969. In fact, it seemed like we were going backwards. Three, two, one, and lift off of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. I thought it was important that we ultimately be on a path towards creating self-sustaining civilization on Mars. And NASA awarded us one of uh, three contracts to upgrade our capability to human transport. What we're looking at here is a Dragon spacecraft pressure vessel. And I like uh, working on engineering and design. The sales and finance are not really my forte. <laughs> We intend to keep advancing the space technology until it's possible for people to go to Mars. If I live, say, another 20 years at least, I think it'll probably happen. So, uh, I sat in a room with him about four years ago. I remember about 30 people in the room, it was a little seminar thing that we were doing at the conference. And uh, he explained. I didn't know that he wanted to go to Mars. I knew that he was into, into developing spacecraft. And he said, no, I, I believe in about 20 years, he said this four years ago, he's still saying 20 years, so the time was shifting. But uh, he basically said, in 20 years, I expect to be sending several thousand people a year to Mars. If they want. Uh, and eventually, he wants, to, he wants to put a million people and develop a whole civilization. And, and you think, well, that sounds kind of crazy, but uh, it's, 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 just a, it's just building a new future. It's, 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 it's just seeing something that, that we don't see. Uh, we're not going to do that if we're stuck with this kind of technology. I was telling the group this afternoon about the experience that I had in December. Uh, for a particular reason, I had occasion to get on Amtrak, which is a, a wonderful thing that I love. And uh, But I got on Amtrak and went from Seattle, where I live, to Chicago. So you go across Idaho, Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and then Chicago. And then I went to Dallas. And then I turned around and came back for two weeks, basically to do the trip. Uh, and uh, the people on the train, the crew on the train, was, were explaining to me that the cars are between 30 and 40 years old, and that's why they're balanced and not swings. And this is the conception of some higher speed trains here on the corridor, and in one case on the western corridor. This is sort of the state of the art in the United States. Uh, whereas if you go to our uh, neighbors over in China, this is a typical rail yard in a typical city. This, this is not a make-believe picture. This is a real picture of real trains in a real city uh, in China. This is us, this is them. Uh, which image of the future is likely to be more fruitful as you move through the 21st century? This one, where we like to say, tell each other, we can't possibly afford to do anything like that. Who could, have, who could actually come up with the money to do that? Uh, we, can't, we actually can't even afford to keep that maintained much less do this, well, somebody's doing this. It all has to do with your image of the future and then what you prioritize based on that image. Uh, here's a couple more contrasting images of the future that I think are interesting when it comes to education. Uh, this, I'm told, is an ancient Hebrew proverb. I, I don't know that it really is, but this is how I learned it. Uh, do not limit your children for, to your own learning, for they were born into a new time. That's the story of the tribe on the river, is don't limit your children to your own learning, for they're born into a new time. Uh, and that suggests that those of us who are parents in schools now, I've done a fair amount, particularly in the 1990s, a lot of 
strategic planning with the schools in some states, particularly in the state of Washington where I live. Uh, and of course what you find is that most of us really believe that schools ought to change as soon as my kids are out. And then, uh, then go ahead and get started with all those big changes that you're talking about. But just let my graduate. And we, 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 we know that schools should improve. We know that schools should get better. We know that they probably should not stay in path. But we also know that we like what we learned and we, we liked sort of the way it was when we were there, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's hard to accept this, that we should somehow do things differently or that we should teach different things. And there's a lot of debate about that, of course, at a national level and on a local level as well. Uh, then as I was uh, getting ready to come here to Chatham, I was uh, looking at some more current material on the future of education, what's happening with education reform. And I came across an article, the lead at the top of which was this quote, was supposedly from Aristotle, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. The Hebrew proverb would suggest, for example, that we might want to give up a lot of things in order to pour all of our money into STEM education, for example. Uh, though we used to do better at STEM education when you think about it, it was more rudimentary uh, math, science, education, and so on uh, back in the day, but more people were into it, uh, fewer people today. And it's true that, uh, as I mentioned this afternoon to the group, uh, I, I read recently that about 25 to 30 percent of Chinese, and I won't overuse them, uh, Chinese uh, college graduates each year are graduating in engineering or science and math about particularly engineering, whereas only about 4 or 5% of our graduates come out in this field. And we may not need that many uh, in terms of the job here, but we do need to do better in that. But this quote from Aristotle also brings home something which is, uh, which is also true, which is uh, there's more education than just the functional aspect. There's something about learning how to be a human being. Uh, Robin Williams is reprising on behalf of the iPad in that television ad which you see running all the time now. And it's a set of lines that he made for that movie. What was the movie uh, in which he played the uh, language teacher at some private school here in the Northeast? Uh, what was it called? Yeah, the Dead Poets Society. The lines which are being played to advertise the iPad are Robin Williams rereading his lines from some point in the movie, Dead Poets Society. And, and there's a lot of truth to it. We're all poets, we're all artists, we all have something to say. And so education can't lose sight of that as well. And the challenge, of course, and I, I, I don't envy all of the, those who are in leadership positions, uh, either on the policy side and on the board or at, in, the, in the administration side or in the classroom itself. How do you balance all of that and how do you accomplish all of that when there's so much that needs to be done? When you watch a video online that will point out that because of the population size of India, there are more honor students in India than there are students altogether in the United States. How do you compete uh, in that world? Well, somehow we have to combine all of these things. And one of the ways you do that is to try to understand a little bit more about what is the future bring, what is out there on the horizon. Now, I'm going to, as quickly as I can, and fairly briefly, the future is a very big world, and so uh, you can't say everything there is to say about the future in a few minutes. But I want to say a couple of things about technology, demographics, economics. Uh, and one big issue, at least, that I think our future graduates are going to be uh, dealing with particularly the younger, uh, those of you who have kids in elementary school. And then I'll conclude with a couple of thoughts on what I think Learning for Tomorrow needs to take into account. On the technology side, it's clear that technology's been accelerating, you know, for as long as we've been around. Uh, and certainly uh, in the last uh, 25 years, since 1990 or so, when the internet really began and we moved into the network society, and now we live in this really full-on network global society where there are something probably now approaching 8 billion cell phones per night for 7 billion people. That is more cell phones than people uh, in the world. Uh, they're all connected. All of our devices are connected. All of our computers are connected. And that's so new, we don't really understand the full implications of what it means to be able to pull something out of your pocket or purse at any time and literally be able to text a message to somebody else in the world virtually anywhere in the world you know, any, any country, I mean, what is a, a, a bigger uh, continent for the cell phone revolution in Africa? And I, and I know that several people, including some people in Africa now, and, and they're way ahead of us in terms of, of the use of cell phone technology. And that was sort of one of the last bastions for the technology revolution. And here we are, in which we're in this full-on connected network society, and we're just now discovering what that really means in terms of implications for work, implications for invention, Implications for learning, and so on. 
And this network society will increasingly become, over the next 15 years, between now and 2027, uh, more three-dimensional. So that whenever you pull a device out, or it's on, maybe it's hooked into your glasses, uh, maybe it's something that you wear, it pops up three-dimensional images, and that may be stimulating holograms, or it might be some other kind of three-dimensional technology that uh, is being worked on. But when you're looking at people and looking at information, you'll see things in this in-depth three-dimensional way as though we're looking at, in a sense, at videos. And that will take us another step in terms of the capacity of this kind of network. And not only that, the machines themselves are getting smarter. I mean, IBM has Watson out in the world now, and we're told that Watson can diagnose cancer better than the average doctor. And it's being tested in financial analysis, being tested in all kinds of fields. And IBM, oh, expects to make about 20% of their revenue versus 3% now from Watson as soon as 2017. So really smart machines. They're not creative, they're not emotional like we are. But they're really smart, they can really crunch a lot of numbers really fast. Uh, that means, according to James McClear, one education writer, that one day in the next 30 years, very quietly, you'll cease to be the brightest things on Earth as measured by certain forms of intelligence measurement, namely the ability to process data and uh, Analyze that data and make suggestions. I'll surround some people from the company called the Stats Institute, a big data company. And this was last year, and they said uh, they work, for example, with the credit card companies to keep track of potential credit card fraud. That's why you get an increasing number of phone calls from your credit card company saying there's suspicious colors on your phone. Uh, and uh, that's because they have these smart machines to keep track of all that. And they're working with the police departments almost to that scary aspect of developing kind of almost departments of street crime, meaning that they give where activity might take place before it takes place. Uh, but they said the stuff that we could, that would take six hours to six days to run, in terms of running an algorithm to crunch a bunch of data, uh, as little as 18 months ago, now takes us just maybe 60 minutes to do the same thing. And so a group of people can sit in the room and make it uh, a Macy store, for example, to, can run a set of sales forecasts. If we change the product uh, mix this way, and we change the price this way, what happens uh, nationwide? And they said you can run model after model after model that hour after hour. And people can sit around and say, okay, bingo, that's the sale we're gonna run next Monday, because that's the one the model says. And before they'd have to send it all up, they'd go home overnight, they'd come back in the next day, and see what the results were, and now they can do an hour after. By some measure, will be not as bright as that. So then that frees us up to do something else. What is that something else? To think of new things, invent new ways of doing things. Uh, it all comes together, I think, this technology revolution. In, in one video, some of you have probably seen this. But if you tie together really smart machines, computers, uh, with other kinds of smart machines, and then you tie it together with global positioning satellite systems, and high-speed communication systems, and you put it all together into a device that we use every day, uh, you can change that device in a radically fundamental way that could change how you and I live to a surprising degree. And if you've seen this video before, you'll enjoy seeing it again, but you have it, it's pretty, it's pretty eye-opening. Here we go. <laughs> Does anybody have any money? I've got money. 
No, I've got my wallet right here. <laughs> you roll down your window and order a burrito. Yes, I can. I'm doing very well. How are you today? This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> Ninety-five percent of my vision is is gone. I'm well past the middle point. You lose your timing in life. Everything takes you much longer. There are some places that you cannot go. There are some things that you really cannot do. Where this would change my life is to give me the independence and the flexibility to go the places I both want to go and need to go. But I need to do those things. So that's a uh, that's a very typical technology that we all use. It's still kind of far fetched, but you know they've driven uh, well over a million miles with the Google self-driving cars. Last I heard, they've only had two accidents, uh, both involved being rear-ended by human drivers. Uh, and uh, I was recently at the American Trucking Association annual meeting, a uh, technology, uh, technology conference, and they were very interested in this. Uh, basically, the whole conversation was about when will truck, trucks drive themselves? They think five to ten years. An increasing percentage of trucks will be self-driving. The truck driver might actually be sitting in an office with a joystick or a monitor of some kind monitoring several different trucks. Uh, they're driving around. So then they ask, so what would be the new skills? What would, a, what would a truck driver need to know and be able to do in order to operate in that kind of environment? Uh, and uh, somebody else at that conference uh, suggested that insurance companies could see major, major change because of this. Starting with the fact that it'll be much safer, self-driving cars will be much safer than human driven cars. And therefore, there could come a day in which uh, your insurance company won't assure you. They'll insure your self-driving car, but not you if you intend to drive. Uh, and they said, mm, I, I thought that's really, really interesting. Uh, if you look at the driving statistics of today's 16 to 24 year olds, you might have seen this in the press, it's been in the press a few times in the last uh, eight months or so, what have you noticed if you've seen it? Uh, they're not getting driver's licenses. Anymore. The number of miles and the number of driver's licenses is plummeting. And if you survey an average 16 to 24-year-old uh, and you say, uh, how would you like to get around? Uh, one of the worst things they can imagine is being forced to sit behind the steering wheel and waste hour after hour after hour being unable to do things. They can't text. Uh, they are, you know, they're not supposed to be distracted, etc., etc., etc. Why would they want to waste their time now? They said they would much rather be in some kind of vehicle that's taking care of the driving for them, so that they can be either productive or be having fun. Uh, and I think that we could see a sort of revolution in that much more quickly than you think. Not just because of the technology, but because of a real uh, culture change. But for me, that ties together a lot of what's happening in the technology acceleration field. The last one is the emergence of the so-called maker society through 3D printing and other kinds of technologies. The uh, printer, a 3D printer big enough to print household type structures. It's actually intended to print houses it's over, over in Europe somewhere. We're doing a lot of experimentation with that. But the title on the slide is called Maker Society, which is a phrase that's, that's really becoming a common one among, oh, let's say, the millennial generation as they're really interested in what is the ability of us to make our own stuff if we could get a hold of the design to have a machine? Five or ten years from now, there will be Kinko store, stores on various corners in various cities and towns. And in those stores, as there are already in two or three of the school buildings here in the district, will be 3D printers. And you can go in with, the, with your design that you downloaded off the internet, just as you, in the old, old days, you go to Kinko's, and it seemed all kind of new for those of us who go to a printer store for the very first time back in the way back. Uh, and you'll be able to print uh, certain kinds of things that will be useful to you. It might be a part for your bicycle. Uh, it might be a new sole for your, for your shoe. I don't know what it might be. But it might be something that will be useful to you that you can get more quickly and perhaps more cheaply by printing it in this way as you move into the maker society. One of the things that's been printed already is this uh, 3D dress 
3D printed dress that Beyonce wore to uh, one of her yeah, The second thing on, on the list, uh, what I want to talk about, uh, that was Russian, uh, that was over the horizon, is the changing shape of the population. One of the things that's happening is that the population is getting older. Another thing that's happening is the population is getting younger. And the third thing that's happening is that it's getting more diverse. Uh, the older generation, this is uh, out of there in 2025, not quite, quite 2027, when our graduate who's going into kindergarten next year is coming out. But you'll see traditionals who were born before the baby boomers are still around. They're only in their 80s, some of them. And we know lots and lots of people, don't we, who are in their 80s or 90s, as an increasing percentage of people, a number of people live to be that age. Baby boomers will pretty much all be retired, although some of them will still be in the workforce. A surprising percentage in their 70s might still be in their workforce. Actually, when you look at that chart, it's kind of surprising how young the baby boomers still are in the year uh, 2025, when you think about it, just age 61 to 79. Then there's Gen X. I, I would guess a lot of Gen Xers in this room born between, let's say, about 1964 and about 1980. And then there's the millennials, and then there's the post-millennial generation. Those are the kids which are coming into the schools now, the elementary kids. The kids basically born in this century. They're actually already coming into to the, uh, to the middle school. That's the real uh, change-making generation, I think, of, of technology. The older generation is dramatic and that is so large. Uh, in the average state uh, in, the, in the US, about 10 to 12% of the population is over the age of 65 today. When you get to 2025, in most states, it'll be 25, 20 to 25% of the population over the age of 65. So some of you do this already. If you want to see the future, go to Florida and look around. Uh, there are about 18% of the population over 65. That's literally what state after state after state is going to look like over the next five to 10 years. And, and if you stop to think about what will it mean when I'm walking down the street in this town or town near here, and one out of every five people I see is over the age of 65. In fact, that world has never existed in the history of planet Earth so far as we know. And that population never lived to be that old. Historically, people lived to be old, but frankly, lived to be old, 65 is the founders of the country. But they were relatively rare, now it's relatively common. And so when you have 20 to 25% of the population over 65, what should we do? How should we organize work? How long should people work? Um, how should you organize school elections if you were encouraged to come out for the election? What will happen when 20 to 25% of the population is over 65? Will they still support schools? Will they still be involved, should they? How could we make them involved? How could you engage an, uh, an increasingly large elder population in the schools, even when they don't have kids or, or grandkids even in the schools? Is there any reason to do that or think about that? I don't know. Uh, but that's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, and then there is the, the millennial generation and the post-millennial generation, or in other words, the first digital native generation. How many of you in the room born since 1980? Raise your hand if you were born since 1980. Just the one. So what's different about her? Uh, she's the, one of the first kids to grow up with screens, and by that I mean computer screens, networked worldwide, globally networked screens everywhere. Uh, if you were born before 1980, well, there were rudimentary computers around. The Apple computers started in the late 70s. There, and some of you really oldies can remember a handy radio chat computer, perhaps. Uh, the early IBM PCs in 1981, and so on. But uh, it's only in the back half of 1980, 1990 that you really get into the true internet generation, the true computing generation. And the world is different if you grew up this way. And everybody has seen this. You watch a two-year-old doing this on a phone. Or you, walk, you watch a three-year-old walk up to a big screen and start waving at it, going like this and getting frustrated because nothing happens. Like it happens when they're home and they've got their Wii going or they've got their Xbox or something, and I can't understand why every screen doesn't work this way. Well, that's a digital native living in the digital world. The rest of us, everybody else in the room is a digital immigrant. You might be in charge of technology at your organization, you might be quite skilled with it, but it wasn't there when you were an infant, or it wasn't there when you were in kindergarten in the way that it is there now for kids here in kindergarten. That will make the world different. A technology revolution has not to do just with technology, but also with the change in generation. One generation invents a technology, baby boomers invented microchips. The next generation deploys it, Generation X has sort of built the internet. But it's the millennial generation that's grown up in the internet, a post-millennial generation, that will really turn it into something. 
that we don't really even see it. It's like the dam that's 100 miles of Google. We, we sort of know that it's there, but we don't really know what it is because it's still kind of foreign to us because we are immigrants and not native. But that's who they are. And the last one in, in, under population is that the population is becoming more diverse. I know that this is quite so true in your community here, but if you look around the country and even around the state, this is what you see. Uh, after the 2012 election, uh, in which the Hispanic population went heavily for Barack Obama, the Pew Foundation got really interested in the forecasts that were being made that if the uh, Latino population continues to go Democratic, at the rate it was going Democratic in 2012, the, there's certain writing on the wall for a certain, de for a certain uh, party, a uh, political party. Okay? And so the Pew Foundation did this study in December, basically, of 2012. This is what they found. Uh, the median age of the native born Latino is 18. The median age of all Latinos is 27 versus 42 for non Latino uh, uh, white population in the U.S. 67,000 U.S. Latinos turn 18 each month, 93% of whom are citizens. And by the way, if you go from 2012 to 2016, you subtract the number of people in the country who are going to die, older voters, you add 67,000 Latinos every month between now and 2018, it's about an 8 million boat ship from one party to another if the party, if they voted along the same party line that they did in 2012. That's a very interesting number, which I know that uh, people uh, are paying attention to. 40% uh, of all U.S. population growth between now and 2030 will be Hispanic, and 77% of all population growth will be groups formally labeled as white order. And so when I go into a boardroom or to a management room in, a, in an American company, and I look around and I say, so where is everybody? And when will we see this population begin to appear in the leadership ranks, management ranks, and everywhere else? Uh, we, were, we were discussing over dinner, if you go to Rutgers, or go to any American university right now, just walk, if you haven't done it, go to, go to a university campus and just walk around a little bit, and about 77% of the people you see don't look like the traditional uh, Caucasian American population. That's the world we're headed to. What does that mean? Not just in terms of who's going to be in schools or working in the working population, but what should we be preparing for? What should we be learning about? What is it we really? uh, Finally, uh, these uh, children, the children of the screen, as I call them, digital natives, don't accept old limitations. I often now tell the story of Jack and Drake. It's such a wonderful story. Uh, it came out through a TEDx speech last year. Drake was a 16-year-old uh, student in biology class last year in some, some school in the U.S. He, the, the, the day's lesson is on antibodies. Uh, he is simultaneously, and against school rules, surfing the net. Uh, he is reading about carbon nanotubes, this little nanotechnology thing. And carbon nanotubes are this little, little thing that can conduct electricity. It has a lot of other properties, but one of his properties that conducts electricity and it's very tiny, it's microscopic. Uh, and he knows somebody, Jack does, who has died of pancreatic cancer, a very serious form of cancer, which is typically discovered late because the pancreas is very deep in the body and it doesn't show up by manipulation. And so people who are diagnosed with it are typically have very late stage cancer and often don't live very long. But it turns out there is an, an element which will show up in the blood if you have pancreatic cancer. Jack is concerned about this because he's had a relative who died recently of pancreatic cancer. Uh, he thinks, well, I wonder if you could put antibodies and carbon nanotubes together and come up with some kind of a test. He dreams up this idea, he writes it up on a piece of paper, he sends it out to 200 research universities. Uh, from which he hears nothing except for one. A researcher, Jones Hopkins, who writes back and says, that's kind of an intriguing idea, why don't we do a project? Long story short, they, they do a project, they create a test using carbon nanotubes, they take a flat sheet of paper, put carbon nanotubes on it, these little tiny microscopic uh, things of carbon, you can hit, a, hit it with electricity, and it has a certain profile. Then you attach antibodies to each of the carbon nanotubes, which can be done through, you know, through engineering. And then you put a wash of blood over this sheet. And if the element that would indicate you have pancreatic cancer is in the blood, that element will go attach itself to the antibody. Right? And if that does, it pushes the carbon nanotubes slightly apart, which changes the electronic or the electric conductivity profile, which is an indicator that it's there in the blood. And thus, Jack and Drake, a 16 year old high school kid, helps create a test which is 168 times faster. 26,000 times less expensive, or 400 times more sensitive than the current standard, costs three cents, per test takes five minutes. 
there is an author that I know named Byron Reese, who is the co-founder of a company called eHow.com, who's written a book called Infinite Progress, in which he says the world is full of jack and drink. Sitting in high school, sitting in middle school, sitting in colleges and universities, sitting at home. And what the internet of today and tomorrow is going to enable is more and more of these kinds of discoveries to be made, particularly if we could structure our environments in such a way that these things can bubble up. With lots of smart people making lots of smart connections uh, in ways that could never have happened before because the information is just not available today. What will digital natives uh, be like in school? What are they like in school? They're already there. Well, what they want is on the left side. They want to work together. They like to work in teams because we do a lot of team things together. Uh, they would like structure and flexibility. They would like structure with flexibility. They'd like active learning, results and awards. They'd like the teachers to be more advisors than just sort of sages on the stage and, and most faculty members will, will relate to that. They like to be treated with respect, etc. On the right side is, uh, is a very intriguing list of what today's kids don't generally get as they grow up that schools might play a role in helping them to learn. Just the nature of the environment in which we live doesn't teach as much of this stuff on the right side anymore. Uh, they don't have much hands-on, non-technological experience. That means planting something, growing something, making something, fixing something without machines, uh, without computing. Literary skills, that is, literally uh, reading and kind of uh, being able to interpret what you read, tolerance for delay. But no big mystery there, right? Uh, perspective that plagiarism is wrong, because everything is always there in front of you. It doesn't occur to them that just picking it up and plugging it, pasting it into my paper might not actually be the way the thing is supposed to happen. Because it's just so easy. Uh, and there, it doesn't take much learning to figure out, well, that's really not how you're supposed to write. But it's surprising how many, how many of us, even in the group, get caught uh, doing it. But we think, oh, it's just so easy. I'll just grab that and stick it in here. Nobody will notice. Now, people do notice, as a matter of fact, machines are really good at noticing that. And some teachers are already using programs that can tell when if this is their right. And so that's, that's a lesson. People skill. Uh, technology resources, if they're on the wrong side of the technology divide, they need the school to provide that for The ability to think and plan for the ability to manage conflict. All of those kinds of things could pop up if, for example, you were uh, doing an exercise in which you asked the question as a district. So what should our kids be able to do, and what should they know in 2027? And it might be 80% similar to what we have today, but it might be 20% different than, than what we have today. And it's a useful exercise for a district to sit down and do from time to time. And you, you need to look out from today's kindergarten or preschooler out to when they graduate from 12th grade. And say, so what would they need to know if they graduate from 12th grade? And what does that tell us we better either need to start teaching next year or by five years from now, we better be prepared to put that into the program or to change things up in the fall. What about the economy? Well, it's a wide, wide world. We know that in 2027, the world is going to be even more global than that. I love this chart. At the top are global trade numbers in the year 2012. Uh, but at the bottom are population numbers. And it's fascinating to think that the Americas altogether are only 14% of the world's population. Whereas the EU, the Commonwealth of Independent States, that's the, the former Soviet Union, Middle East, Africa are 33%, where China, India, Japan, etc., are 53% of the world's population. Where is the world economy really going to head in this century? When you look at that. But well, we're not going wet, but you can really kind of see some implications there. Uh, and one implication is we have to rethink the future of the American economy. This is the most powerful chart that I've seen in the last two years. Uh, I know it doesn't apply very much to to this school district, because something like I heard today, 99% of your uh, students uh, over 99% graduate from high school, and something like 98%, something like that, uh, go on to either four or two year college. This is a very interesting chart uh, based on a study from the Hamilton Project. It basically asks two questions comparing 1970 to the year 2010. If you graduate with a high school diploma, what are the odds you get a, you get a job, and what do you get paid? And the chart is regularized for $2010. In 1970, this is, this is one of the biggest revolutions in the history of this country, really, when you think about it. In 1970, if you graduate with a high school degree, according to the chart, uh, oh, by the way, they, they, did the, they did the study just on men, not on women, because in 1970, not enough women were in the workforce to make it really comparable. 
uh, although the, the same thing applies to women today. Uh, and the chart actually applies to college graduates as well, although the numbers are shifted upward in terms of salary. But in 1970, if you graduated from high school, you had a 95% chance of getting a job if you came out of school. And your average wage of $2,010 was about $50,000. That's why in 1970, in the United States of America, it was not unusual for a high school graduate to support a family, own a home, own a vacation vehicle, and perhaps even a vacation home, all on a single job, a single salary with a high school diploma. That world is virtually gone. By 2010, uh, if you look at the chart, you only had, now that was the depth of the Great Recession, it is true, but you only had a 75% chance of being employed, and the average wage in 2010 dollars was $26,000. The wages had fallen by half, and the odds of getting a job were much, much lower. Now what that suggests is we need to really do some thinking about the future of the middle class in the American economy. There are lots of reasons why this is true, but it also suggests why we need to ratchet everybody's education attainment up there. We need to graduate better people, and we need to, we need to graduate everybody's uh, skills upward in order to compete. And it's called, in my language, income gap or not. So if you want to, if you want to look at political battles, uh, not to mention economic battles over the next 10 years, they're going to be all about income gap economics. The question of what do we do when there is such a big gap between those who are earning a lot in our world and those who are not? And is it, is it, is it, is it, do we, is it the job of education to fix that? Is it a policy issue? Is it something for businesses themselves to look at? What do we do about it? How do we reinvent a world that used to exist? But it's partly an education issue. A lot of it will come to the education community and you'll be asked to prepare students better, uh, to focus them more on uh, marketable skills, even though we don't want school just to be a utilitarian exercise, but especially we'll be wanting to get kids into higher education at a higher and better rate. What it really means is that we have to prepare for this kind of an economy, which is a knowledge value economy. A Japanese writer wrote a book by that title back in the mid 1980s, and he said, Where the world is going is to knowledge value. So what that means is the ability of any product or service or person to compete in the marketplace will depend on how much knowledge you have. How smart is it? How smart are you? You can illustrate it really well with, it, with an iPhone. Or, well, I'll use iPhone, which I have in my pocket. You go into a phone store. You've got uh, enough money to buy any phone you want in the store. So the money is not so much the object, although in some cases you might choose one because it's a little bit less expensive. But if you've got enough money to buy any phone in the store, what are you going to buy? You're going to look at it and say, that one is smarter. This one was made by smarter engineers. This one has better information in it. The apps that go into it are smarter. They're made by smarter people. That phone will make me smarter if I use it. That phone will make me look smarter when I take it out of my pocket or my purse. Everybody around me will go, oh, you've got the new one. You're smart. Uh, now, among the millennial generation, this is not necessarily a smart phone. Now it's the Android, of course, the Galaxy phone, which according to the millennial generation is a smarter phone uh, than the iPhone. Uh, for us older older folks, this is, this is now they think of it as sort of grandpa's phone. Like that's the whole advertising campaign that they do. Uh, but the, the bottom line is still the same. They're choosing that, the millennial generation, because they think it's smarter than the iPhone. It's not because just because it's cooler. It's not just because it's a little bit cheaper. It's mostly because they think it's smarter. It's easier to use. It makes me smarter than the user. Now the same thing that applies to a product and service applies to a person. Your ability to compete when there's 50 people competing for a job depends on your ability to acquire new knowledge on a regular basis. In a world of work in the 21st century, which is different from the world of work of the 20th century. In the 20th century, work like, looked like what's on the left, jobs, static jobs, one size fits all, you're paid according to a pay scale. A change is relatively slow. Uh, but on the right side, uh, work has become very stint-based. That's a kind of a complex term in some ways, but it just simply means people don't work in long-term jobs anymore. They move from stint to stint to stint. So when a young person is told, you're likely to have you know, six or seven or eight jobs in your lifetime, what you're really being told is you're likely to have six or seven or eight different stints. And one might last three years, one might last five years, one might last six years, and they might be in different industries and so on. That's clearly where the world is moving. Uh, and you don't need to be, have big explanations for that. But it's also, uh, work happens all the time. It's asynchronous. Uh, 
Uh, we're working wherever we are. You're capable of working wherever you are in many kinds of jobs. Uh, work is both technical and personal. I like that one. Um, very, uh, in the old days, really as old, just as recently as the 70s, maybe even the 80s, an awful lot of what we think of today as computing took place in back rooms uh, and was performed by certain magician, magicians, you know, called the, the tech people uh, or the computer people, whatever it was. And a lot of people didn't have much sort of touch with it. And now very uh, few of us don't do work that doesn't involve interacting with technology in some way. And yet you might also be the one who faces the customer or faces a person. And so you've got to be both technically competent and personally competent. And I think that becomes more true over the next 15 years. That the ideal graduate who comes out of this course, for example, would be somebody who is highly technical competent, but also highly personally capable, capable of getting up. Unlike the video that we saw, I hate getting up, I hate to get up and give a speech. Everybody ought to be able to get up and give a speech without a telephone. Uh, and feel comfortable doing it. In fact, you enjoy doing it. It's not that hard to train. Uh, interpersonal skill, all kinds of personal skills that are valuable as well. Uh, and if you look at where the world is going, you've got to be good, not just at one or the other, but at both. And finally, um, what will our kids be dealing with in 2027, even more so than we are today? Well, one of the things that I think they'll be dealing with uh, is the future of the planet. And in particular, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in what happens uh, to so-called uh, climate change and its impact on our world. We've seen another, another bout of that, perhaps, uh, this year. It's kind of an interesting thing. You've gone through one of the coldest winters, uh, certainly your memory, uh, and here I am in another day in it here. It seems like every time I go to the East Coast this winter, I hit one of, one of the deepest out of the cold days here was going to be warm yesterday, it's going to be warm tomorrow, one day here. Uh, it's, it's cold. Whereas in Seattle, we, it was 65 degrees and sunny yesterday. Uh, and we had an unusually dry, unusually warm uh, winter, many days, the 50s, some days, the 60s, which is unpredictable. But these two, these two phenomena are connected. And they're all connected to something that I think of as a canary in the coal mine, which is something that I, I just enjoy telling everybody about, even if it only has a little bit to do with the subject of the night. Um, it has, it's called ice in the Arctic. About Oh, it was just before Hurricane Katrina. Which, which year did Hurricane Katrina come? Anybody remember? New Orleans? 2005. So this is now some time ago. I was working on a project with the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation. And we were asking uh, a question in a number of programs around the country. Uh, if, the, if the federal government was going to spend money on advanced research and transportation, what should be the research question? We did one particular two-day event up in Boston, and one of the persons who was invited was a young woman who was the cold weather engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, cold weather road engineer. And her job was uh, helping to plan uh, the roads that are built in the Arctic and elsewhere up in the North Alaska. Uh, and she said, well, you know, the, the, and I've never heard this before that she said this, she said, you know, the Arctic is warming up at two times the rate of the rest of the planet. She said, in fact, you used to be able to drive on the ice, so if you've seen ice road truckers at television, so you used to be able to drive on the ice in the Arctic a certain number of months every year, and that has shrunk by over a month and a half in the last decade and a half, she said, because the, it melts out. It freezes later, it melts out soon. So she said, pay attention to the Arctic. Because as the ice melts in the Arctic, she said, uh, it's going to change the weather patterns in the lower 48. And what we're going to get is more severe storms. This was a month before Katrina. She said, as a matter of fact, I think we're going to start getting so many severe storms that at some point in my lifetime, people on the Gulf Coast are going to throw up their hands and they're going to say, I give up. I can't live through another. And they're going to move in. That was before Katrina, before Sandy, and so on. So since that time, I've been keeping track of the amount of ice in the Arctic. I don't keep track of it personally. I go to the Snow and Ice Data Center, which every day, uh, in Boulder, Colorado, puts out a report on how much ice is there today in the Arctic Ocean. So, and I, I went there uh, just uh, at the beginning of the week just to see what the, the February photos were because I, I knew I was coming east and I wanted to tell you the story. 
Every summer, the ice in the Arctic melts. The sun is up 24 hours a day. And it actually gets above freezing. And so the sun is beating 24 hours a day on the ice and it melts out. And so by the end of the summer, mid-September, there's only a portion of the ice left floating in the Arctic, Arctic Ocean. And a lot of it is melting. Uh, and then it begins to refreeze, and by this time of year, of course, it's, it's all frozen. And then it begins to melt again, usually about mid-May, it begins to melt out again as the, the sun comes up. Again. So each year, for a number of years now, this data center has kept track of how much ice there is there in mid-September each year. It reached the lowest level ever in the year 2012. It was a little bit more in 2013. Uh, and from that, they, they use the satellite imagery uh, to create this little uh, silent video, which will start in 1980 and go out to the year 2012, and show you the amount of ice left in mid-September in the Arctic Ocean each year, as it sort of waxes and wanes year by year. It goes up one year and down the next year, and up one year and down the next year. But overall, the trend line is down until you get to the years before in our uh, time in history. And you'll see in 2012 that there's not very, very much ice left. It won't be that long until you can go kayaking in the North Pole in August. That's what you want to do. Uh, I checked on, uh, on Monday, and uh, the amount of ice in, uh, at the end of February in the Arctic is the fourth lowest level ever measured, lower than in February of 2012, suggesting that we could reach another ice minimum uh, this summer. Uh, it may not happen. Uh, the weather patterns could change a little bit. Perhaps it could happen. But you can see that the overall, line, overall trend line is down. That meant that this year, the just completed last week, uh, Iditarod uh, sled dog race from Nome, Alaska down to Anchorage, they had to truck in the snow to put on the, uh, the, uh, the route because there was no snow in Alaska because they're having, they've had one of the warmest winters ever in history in Alaska. In fact, it was the warmest January in the history of the world, worldwide. You don't believe that. But it was an all-time record uh, warm January in Australia, an all-time record warm January in South America. Uh, and so we have to be careful not to interpret our own conditions for what's going on in the rest of the world. Now, what does this mean? Uh, around the North Pole goes the jet stream. You've been hearing about this, the polar vortex. And usually it has a fairly regular pattern to it, but now it's beginning to oscillate more and more, like this. And what that means is that it spills the cold air deeper into the country. or it stays locked up higher, longer, which means you get a, a drought in California for a longer period than normal. And it's only an, an hypothesis right now, but the scientists are hypothesizing that if the ice continues to diminish in the Arctic, we could see this greater oscillation of the jet stream for longer periods of time, leading to more variable weather patterns, i.e. longer, deeper cold spells, longer, deeper hot spells. That's why, in other words, wild weather. The safest forecast as a result of climate change is wild weather. What does that mean for our kids? Let's suppose that the scientists could be right about this, those who are making that point. That means that uh, in 2027, our kids are going to be dealing even more than we are with these words on the screen, like sustainability or resilience, you know, rebuilding the coastline so it's more resilient to the next storm that comes in. Or coming up with uh, town zoning uh, requirements that require more storm resistance or uh, weatherizing our, our uh, power system so it can stand up the storm system better. And so on. That's what our, I think our kids could be dealing with. It might be an additional set of knowledge or additional set of skills. It might only be an extension of what we already learned. But I think it is, if you ask me as a teacher to make a prediction, this is one thing that I predict that they're going to be dealing with in 2027. There's always a chance that we, that we could be wrong, but I don't think so. One of the ways they might be dealing with it is beginning, particularly by them, to more, even more seriously than we do now, to reconceptualize the future energy system. This is a great illustration from a guy that I know uh, who wrote a book called uh, Infinite Resource about the ability of human creativity and technology to overcome the problems that we face. He says, let that drop represent all the fossil fuels we burn in a day on planet Earth, all the oil, all the gas all the propane, everything that you can name that's a fossil fuel. That's how much we burn in a day. It's a lot, actually. Uh, and then, replace it with the sun. And in nine seconds, the sun provides that much energy to the planet Earth. If we can only figure out how to harness it, 
one century from now, our ancestors, that is, our kids' kids, maybe our kids' grandkids, will be primarily living, not exclusively, we will still be using some fossil fuels for some things, but they will primarily be living, I think, in a solar society, where most of the energy that we use, whether it's in our automobiles, or whether it's in our homes or our, our commercial buildings like this, will come in one way or another uh, from solar energy, although there's some technology. What does that mean, finally, for learning? Knowledge value needs bought, needs knowledge. Right? That means that our communities, we have to figure out how to enable millions of people in our communities to learn one step up from where they're learning now, whether that's a different and better form of learning even for our kids in school today, a new set of knowledge and skills that they're gonna need for 2027, or whether that's if you think of the masses of people in our country, not in this school district, but in other districts, even in this state, who don't have access to what you all have access to. How can we bring them along? That's a whole other thing. If you look at education at a glance in the U.S., we have, we have some catching up to do. Uh, when you compare us to the rest of the world, it's not so much we have catching up. We have to run faster to keep up with where the world is catching up with us. It used to be that we were just sort of naturally ahead in everything because we had such a good school system and such a head start compared to much of the world. That head start was gone. And so you see numbers like this everywhere you look, every time you pick up something on education, that we're either falling behind or we have to run faster in order to keep up with the rest of the world. Uh, that's all true. So, how, so what we need to do is to innovate and learn. And I like this illustration. I, I got this from a guy who worked in virtual reality technology here in Washington. He said we still learn basically by reading about things and studying things, rather than immersing ourselves in them. He said, what we really need to do with the technology tools which are now available to us, and which will be available to us in the next 13, 14, 15 years, we need to come up with learning strategies that enable people to be more immersed in the things that are really important, and the things that are really interesting and valuable for them. And what that really means is planning, for a new future rather than just coming up with a more efficient path. In other words, innovating to unlock the power of human intelligence by getting bandwidth to the brains of more people and immersing them in learning environments. One of the really cool things that we can do with technology today is, and I'll never forget when, uh, when computing first became available really in, in full form to homes in the 1990s. Our kids were in school at the ages your kids were in the 1990s. And uh, my wife was a scout troop leader, and Microsoft had put out the Encarta Encyclopedia for the home computer. And she was teaching the scout troop about how airplanes fly. She worked for both. And on a, in, in that time in Encarta, you could go in and you could get an illustration. I had a little video of uh, being able to take up a piece of paper and blow over the top of it, and the paper goes up in the air. If you blow over the top of it, and that's how wings lift an airplane, because the air is flowing over the the top of the wing is what lifts the airplane. Most people don't know that's how an airplane flies. It's because the air, the air is actually lifting the, air, the airplane into the air if you've got the right speed over the top of the wing. And, and Carter illustrated that. And she was blown away. And the kids practically cheered because that's a very hard thing to explain. Of course, she was blowing up the paper. But to see the video, then everybody could try it. It was immersing them in something that is now easy for us to do. And we're, we're in now a world in which you can immerse people in learning in ways that we couldn't not that many years ago, and that would be even more true in the future. Linking minds, getting bandwidth between more brains. One of the exciting potentials for the future is linking our kids in their schools and classrooms to kids and schools and other classrooms. A lot of national media or uh, technology companies work that do ad television advertising campaigns based on this, but it's literally true that if we could revamp things in the right way, we can enable kids to go anywhere, anytime. I think that's going to come. Finally, connecting to the future, applying intelligence to real world needs. Kids get excited when they're dealing with real stuff. And the more that we can engage education to do that, the better. In the end, the future creates the present. If you change what you're thinking about the future, you'll see things that you could do today that make, that make it more likely to go in the direction that you want it to. If you start with the question, what is my image of the future? And you answer that question with, what is my preferred future? What do I want to look like, like Elon Musk does? 
but you immediately see some things that we could be doing there. In the end, if you do that, you discover that the future is not something that just happened. The future is something else. Thanks for having me.